Australia's federation in 1901 now lies at the exact middle point between 2014 and the arrival of the first fleet in 1788. Despite this, I suspect that most Australians see federation as being more a creature of the first half of Australia's political existence than our second half. This view of federation is what I think of as the brass vase view, which is that our federation is something to be brought out on rare occasions for a quick polish when visitors are coming, but otherwise basically relegated to a dusty corner. This is a shame because the federation process in the 19th century was the political uh, uh, courage to undertake a radical reform process in pursuit of the opportunities created by new political and economic structures, as well as broader strategic concerns about Australia's place in the world. Despite being conceived in the 19th century, Federation was a child of the 20th century, and the challenge for us now is to think of the next stage of its development and the opportunities that a new wave of reforms could create. This is not because Federation has been a failure. On the contrary, as Glenn Withers and Anne Toomey and Anne's with us today have shown, Federation has delivered great economic benefits to Australia. And in partnership, the two of them uh, both usefully summarised the benefits that nations receive from an effective Federation into what they termed the six C's. Checks on powers by protecting the individual from an overly powerful government, as well as ensuring greater scrutiny of government action. Secondly, choice in voting options, ranging from the time-honoured tradition of people voting for one party at the national level and another at the state level, to the choice to move between states, as Victoria found to its cost in the late 1980s. Three, customisation of policies, meeting the needs of people and communities uh, they directly affect across a large and increasingly diverse nation with substantial differences in climate, geography, demography, culture, and income. Fourth, cooperation, encouraging, encouraging joint approaches to reform, and there are a lot of successful examples of that in Australia, which means the proposals tend to be more measured and better scrutinised, and which ultimately does, not refor does give reform pr proposals greater legitimacy and potential for bipartisan support. Fifth, competition, creating incentives between states and territories to improve performance, increase efficiency, and prevent complacency. In fact, Withers and Toomey actually showed that, despite having an extra layer of government, federations have proportionately fewer public servants and lower public uh, spending than unitary states. This idea is supported by actual change in the size of Australia's public sector employment. The proportion of the total workforce employed in the entire public sector at three levels, all purposes, has declined over 30 years from 25% to 16% now. And then sixthly, creativity, which allows successful innovations in one state to be picked up by other states and, of course, policy failures avoided. For example, the introduction of case mix funding, which has revolutionised the funding of public hospitals in Australia it began in Victoria in, in the early 1990s and gradually extended to almost every other state and to the Commonwealth. To that list, you could also add Withers and Toomey's assessment that, and this is point number seven, federalism increased Australia's prosperity in 2006 dollars by $4,507 per head beyond the amount which would be available if Australia had a unitary system of government. And they argue this amount could be almost doubled if our federal system was more financially decentralised. Now, there's an elaborate reason for that, but I won't go into it. And then the, the eighth point, countries with federal systems have tended to outperform unitary states over the last 50 years, even allowing for the intrinsic difficulties in making these sorts of assessments. It bears reiterating that the cost of government measured as a share of GDP is lower in Australia than in almost all comparable countries. It's lower than in the United States and Canada. Significantly, it's also lower than many unitary states, including the UK and New Zealand, giving the lie to the oft-asserted idea that state-level government is an intrinsic drag on a national economy. 
It is therefore also reasonably supposed that Federation is at least partially responsible for successive Australian governments being able to offer relatively high levels of services to its citizens at an internationally competitive cost. So rather than seeing Federation as some sort of antique brass vase, I think it's better viewed as a highly functional kitchen appliance. Used well and used creatively, it can do a lot better than Canberra can achieve alone. So my proposals for change to our Federation are not based on the failure of our Federation. On the contrary, they are based on the new opportunities that could be created by a new practice of government within our current political structures. And it's that, I think, the Prime Minister was inviting us to have a conversation about during his Tenterfield oration over the weekend, which I greatly welcome. So here are four proposals from my perspective about shifting that combination of funding and functions that I think we could feasibly adopt. First, as suggested by the Commission of Audit, the Commonwealth should walk its own talk on schools by assigning responsibility for schooling to the states and transferring an agreed share of income tax revenues to them for that purpose. This would have the added virtue of cleaning out the programmatic confetti that has traditionally been sprinkled by Commonwealth ministers across the education sector to the great de uh, detriment of the sector as a whole. From our experience, there's good reason to think that this implementation of the subsidiarity principle would work. We know that the introduction of case mix funding has substantially reduced growth in the cost of hospital services in Australia. The vast disparity in cost in the US between the same procedures done in different hospitals is well documented, and its economic inefficiency is hard to reconcile with the evangelical view of efficiency in health markets advanced by a small number of people in Australia. The Productivity Commission's Blue Book has also shown that in states where devolution has been a long-term bipartisan political objective, per capita cost of hospitals and schools has been lower than in most other states. It is also striking that the most complex health systems, that is public hospitals, are still operated by state governments and that, thanks to reforms including case mix, they are relatively efficient and successful. In fact, it's the areas of the Commonwealth uh, responsibilities in health, particularly primary care and aged care, that continue to exhibit major difficulties and that are a source of dissatisfaction in the community and result in cost transfers into the public hospital system. We could probably be better served as a nation if, incrementally, the Commonwealth simply backed out of service delivery and, other transferred, and either transferred bulk funding to the states or made citizen-specific payments available for hospitals, schools and VET using a needs-adjusted standard funding mechanism in schools that used to be called a voucher. In hospitals, it's now called case mix. And there's an equivalent for vocational education and training. The Commonwealth is simply not the answer to the problem. It is, in fact, creating or perpetuating the problem. My second point is that there's considerable merit in the broadly mooted proposal to increase the rate and coverage of the GST and transfer the extra revenue generated to the states hypothecated for public hospitals. So as, as Nick spoke about hypothecation approvingly before, I speak about it with real enthusiasm. On the question of GST, we also need to fix a mistake that was made by the states in initially agreeing that there would be an equalisation process across states based in pooled GST revenue. In essence, I think that GST revenue should stay in the state where it was raised, where it was raised, and that the legitimate equity concerns of small states and territories should be dealt with separately by the Commonwealth through drawings on general Commonwealth revenue. The current situation simply isn't tenable. The relativity factor for Western Australia is currently 0.376 which means that compared to a straight per capita split, they get about one third of what they're really entitled to. And a per capita split is itself unfair, given what I said a moment ago about GST. Third, state governments should be encouraged to develop a land tax or property charge with a broader base of applicability, but at a much lower rate than currently applies. The new tax should also replace stamp duty obligations on property transfers. Underpinning this system would be the principle that the revenue raised from the tax or charge 
should be spent in the city in which it was raised. If it is raised in Melbourne or Newcastle, then it gets spent in Melbourne or Newcastle. Overwhelmingly, this new revenue stream should be hypothecated to public transport improvements within the city in which it was raised. This would have the added advantage of making asset-rich inner city dwellers, frankly like myself, contribute fairly to whole of city transport investments and thus draw down some of their personal windfall gains in property value over time. This, I believe, is a legitimate policy goal because, because the gains in well-established areas are, in part, a product of historic infrastructure investments funded from general revenue, especially for the purposes of roads and public transport, as well as general urban amenity. At the moment, the only people paying direct, hefty charges for public in infrastructure are the least well off in major cities, <coughs> struggling to afford a house and land package in outer suburban developments. The other great virtue of hypothecation is that it is one of the few pieces of economic orthodoxy that the public actually understands. No wonder treasuries around the country are so opposed to it, although I'm sure that Phil Gaitchens wouldn't have that view. I saw Phil here before. I hope he wouldn't have that view. And John Pearce, a former New South Wales Treasury head, is also here. Though I think John might have opposed hypothecation in times past. Yes. If you tell the public uh, that we raise this money and that it goes directly to pay for that government action, as we did with the East Timor levy, levy and the gun buyback, then the community is generally more disposed to accept it. My fourth point, as cautiously suggested in a report by the Productivity Commission, state governments could extend road use charging to existing freeways, highways and major arterial roads within cities. This revenue would again be hypothecated towards the building and maintenance of these classes of roads and availability-based payments to PPP consortia where needed for new roads. This funding could be further augmented by the fuel taxes collected by the Commonwealth being hypothecated towards building and maintaining roads. The community is legitimately angry about the idea of paying more for roads when the original intention was that the Commonwealth fuel excise would go entirely to this purpose. Currently, it doesn't. Transferring most of these tax revenues to the states would be part of an historic settlement to petition government roles in transport in favour of the states and local government and would roll back the current process of the Commonwealth second-guessing other governments. Having each major city pay this combination of property and road charges into their own pools to finance their road and public transport systems would be a substantial step forward towards providing the infrastructure needed by our major capital cities which currently generate an enormous percentage of national wealth but whose taxes effectively disappear into consolidated revenue at the Commonwealth level. This approach would also provide the resources and pressure to fill one of Australia's most pressing gaps in governance coordinated long-term strategic planning on a whole of city basis across land use, transport, utilities, hospitals, schools and TAFEs. So to conclude, none of this would be an easy political sell and would need political leadership capable of building a comprehensive political strategy and a realistic communications approach to help ordinary citizens understand the benefits. It would, however, play to the strength of political leaders their latent desire to chart a course towards a solution for the big problems of contemporary Australia. Done well, this would also have the advantage of constructing a broader base for bipartisan consensus on reforms which are, using John Howard's expression, fair and in the national interest. As the reforms of the 1980s and 90s show, this is a prerequisite for successful reform, the topic of an earlier CEDA publication of great importance. The above suggestions amount to a major change in Australia's practice of government. It would mean, amongst other things, a dramatically different role for the public service at the Commonwealth level, one that was increasingly focused on providing strategic and technical advice to government and far less involved in service delivery. It is also striking that some of the core players in this transformation would be the state premiers, the same group who were central to the process that culminated 114 years ago. 
What we need now are a group of premiers who are interested in saving the Federation that their political predecessors helped to create. They would do this not by transferring more of their power to the centre, but be, by being the conduit through which more power and accountability flows into the local governance structures that states and local government are best suited to build and support. Thank you.